Hi everyone, welcome to the finale of the second season of Between Us. We'd like to urge you one last time to go to your smartphone right now, go to the App Store, and download Metafi. M-E-T-A-F-I. You can open it up and start documenting right now how you feel. You can locate the feeling in your body. I'll do it right now as I'm working on this episode. It's summer in Seattle. I'm sitting on my back porch in the 85 degree weather. I take out my phone and open Metify. I name the feeling, joy. I pick a more accurate descriptor, contentment. I locate it in my heart. I categorize it as leisure. No typing, which I love. And there are all the stats on my emotional experience waiting right there for me. When we are aware of our emotional and bodily experience, we gain the ability to regulate that experience. Medify is developed by professional therapists. It's easy to use, and it's free. They've been our partners for this season, so go and show them your thanks by downloading the app today and begin to be your best self. This conversation with Dr. Galit Atlas is also brought to you by the Center for Object Relations, or CORE, a nonprofit organization in Seattle whose mission is to increase the knowledge and application of object relations theory in psychotherapeutic practice. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, object relations is a psychoanalytic orientation. It emphasizes the importance of early attachment and experiences on unconscious life and human development. Since 1994, CORE has offered a wide variety of classes, seminars, and consult groups to therapists interested in learning how object relations theory can help them understand their patients, themselves, and the therapeutic relationship with greater depth and sensitivity. If you live in the Seattle area, the Center for Object Relations is offering a new slate of classes starting in September. If you're interested in taking a class or in learning more about CORE and object relations, visit nwfdc.org. You can also find CORE on Facebook. Yeah, I, I, I feel a little bit uh, discombobulated, which is what I felt at times reading the text. And also that seems like part of sexuality and desire, that it can be discombobulating. Um, that it can can take you feel that right now when you're talking to me? I can. It, it was like I had a plan of what to talk about, and then there was a point of, oh, okay, we went in this direction, and, um, and yeah, there's a part of wanting to get grounded again, that kind of feeling. Yeah. So it's my turn. Oh, right. Yeah? Yes, yes, your turn. Um, have you ever been in love? Yes. Next question. What wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait. So I can give one word answer? Sure, why not? No, no. After I went into such private details about my first sexual yeah, feeling. I, I know, but guy. sexual, those are two very different questions. I mean, I could answer the sexual feelings things, no problem. But, you know, love. I mean, what if I asked you about love? <laughs> I would have lied, but at least, yeah, you know, I would have made up a lied. great story. I mean, <laughs> I don't great. Know. I mean, love is a complex issue, you know? I mean, it's like, uh,. I mean, yes, I have told somebody that I love them before, and I've meant it, you know, but was it totally uh, unselfish, giving love? Was it a beautiful thing? Not really. You know, it's like, love, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm John Totten, and this is Between Us. Earlier this year, I took a class in which Dr. Gali Atlas's book, was the main text. The book is called The Enigma of Desire, Sex, Longing, and Belonging in Psychoanalysis. I kind of thought that when I signed up for this class that we would be talking a lot about sex, and certainly a pragmatic discussion of sexuality is part of Dr. Atlas's work. But what I was not expecting was a way of using sex to discuss all relational patterns. It makes sense, though, that sex is not simply ever just sex. It's common, even cliche, for patients of psychotherapy to become attracted to their therapists. And we know that this is also not just about the therapist. That in an emotionally intimate relationship such as therapy, all kinds of stuff gets stirred up for the patient. When we talk about sex, we're talking about arousal, 
And when we talk about arousal, we are talking about all kinds of desire, emotional changes, and experiences. The scope of Dr. Atlas's work is appropriately nuanced and expansive. It's about sex, but it's also about love, family, food. It's about everything, really. And honestly, I don't always understand it. But that's okay. It's for that reason that I asked the class that I took from a group called Relational Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy in Seattle to contribute some of the questions for our talk today. Galit Atlas is a psychoanalyst who practices in Manhattan. She teaches at New York University's postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. She has contributed to the New York Times and has served on the board of the Division of Psychoanalysis for the American Psychological Association. And she was nice enough to speak with me from her office in New York. Before we start, there's a couple things I have to say about terms. We've talked several times in this season about the term affect regulation. And for our purposes, just remember to think about this term as if it means managing emotions. And there's another term I've been putting off defining. We talked a little bit about it in episode 14. But the term is enactment. I'm sure my definition will be easy to impugn. But think about enactments in therapy as the playing out of past scripts for both the patient and the psychotherapist. And not even with words. Here's Galit. I guess my first question for you is these categories of the pragmatic and the enigmatic. When did you first find yourself using that language and finding it useful? Mm. You know, it's a good question. That started actually as a paper that I wrote for a presentation with Beatrice Beebe. And I started with talking about affect regulation and infant research and arousal and regulation as, as part of sexuality and attachment and sexuality. And then I moved into the realm of enigmatic and the otherness, right? And when I submitted that paper for the first time for publication, one of the feedback that I got was that these are two different languages and why are you using two different languages in one paper? And so what I did in response is instead of withdrawing, I decided to actually develop it even more and to define the two languages as two different aspects of one thing that are part of one thing, right? The dialectical tension between the two and each exists in the other, which is the enigmatic and the pragmatic. The enigmatic is more, right, the otherness, that thing that we cannot fully know and grasp, versus the pragmatic, which is what we can see, measure, evaluate. And and I try to find the balance and the way they, they live together. And all of those dialectic tensions between day and night, between right things that seem disconnected but in fact are right related to one big thing right there is no day without night there is no night without day right mm-hmm. so was the early feedback that you got around the duality of your language around this was it was it negative was it the feedback that this is problematic to have this kind of yeah um, absolutely that it was it, that it was confusion of two different languages Right. If you write about infant research, you cannot talk about La Planche, right? This is a different language, which is which is kind of true, right? But but you know, of course, my rebellious self said, so what if it's two different languages? So what? What? Why can't I talk about La Planche? My thought was, okay, so let me constitute that, right? I'm talking to two different languages, and I'm going to frame it as two different languages, that it's not an accident, right? It's on purpose. Two different languages, two different aspects of the same thing. And of course, there is enigmatic in every pragmatic and pragmatic in every enigmatic. When I think of the negative feedback you got, it's not terribly surprising, but it sounds like what you're describing to me is also colorful. And when I read your book, there seems to be a sense that you don't mind using different kinds of brush strokes to paint a picture. Mm-hmm. And I also don't mind negative feedback. Uh, I'm saying it, uh, you know, part of it is a joke and it's part of reality. You know, it's, it's okay it's, if people have uh, criticism and thought, you know, any thoughts. I'm 
But that is really okay with me. It doesn't mean that I did what they told me to do. I actually did exactly the opposite. How would you describe the work you do and the theories that you are working on to someone who isn't familiar with your work? This is the hardest question you could ever come with, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because when, uh, you know, when I had to write the introduction for my book, that was the hardest chapter for me to write because it was supposed to introduce my book and to basically tell people what this is about and make them maybe want to read it. And I took me, I think, six months to write it. It's so hard for me to, to describe my own work. I, I write more like a person that is in touch with a moment, mm. in touch with something that is going on between two people. I, I was going into this book expecting it to be um, sexy, and yet there's so much about protecting our client from that dysregulation that can happen with arousal. Right. But arousal is not necessarily always sexy, right? It can be right. threatening, it can be anxiety provoking, and especially in the therapeutic diet, it can be really dysregulating and not sexy at all. I mean, you can ask uh, analysts and patients. I hear patients coming and telling me my, uh, you know, about their an first analysis that they left because the analyst told them that they are either they love them or tr or attracted to them, N not even in a boundary violation way in maybe let's let's give them the benefit of the doubt right that it was in a in a more real loving way to say oh i really love you and people get so dysregulated and scared it's too intense for them it's too intense for them and so again sex is not always sexy and uh, you know the book is about sexuality but it actually demonstrates i think that sexuality is everywhere and it's about birth and death and how desire is about everything. In that sense, I think you're right to think that there is much more about the unknown than maybe you wanted, right? Because there is something about mm -hmm. the word sexy, right? That feels like it, it has, it's about the body, it's about something tangible. And that the body and genitals and flesh on flesh is just the most concrete version of something that is actually abstracted forever that is happening in all kinds of abstract forms around us uh, yeah listen i feel like and again maybe it's my feminine mind if there is such a thing right <laughs> that uh, that there is something about the enigmatic that is much more sexy than the pragmatic right <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing because you don't agree with me, huh? Uh, y yes. Yeah, I mean, that is basically why I'm laughing. I, I, and knowing that I am just my own subjective self and that it's different for others, th that was one of my thoughts running through uh, as I read your work is, am I not getting this because of my practical male brain? <laughs> there is something about my desire to want it laid out all neatly in front of me. Uh, that I'm not going to get from delving too far into this topic. Listen, I hate to differentiate uh, between the masculine and the feminine in, in such a you know a binary way because of course we all hold everything also. But I do hear a lot of that from patients, you know, especially about the actual sex, right? That uh, you know, and women complaining that they're. Uh, spouses or boyfriends or come in and and they expect that oh um, let's have sex and and they take their clothes and it's done you know <laughs> so I'm thinking about and and we're staying with that space where there is seduction and preparation and uh, something more enigmatic in that sense more about the mind than about the body and then about the mind and the body right and going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Simply put, sex is never just sex. Yeah. And, and everything uh, that is not sex is also probably about sex. What Gully is doing here is actually quite liberating to both therapists and patients. I think for all parties involved, one of the scariest things that can happen to us is when erotic feelings are somehow involved in the therapeutic relationship. 
But when we allow ourselves to understand these longings in an enigmatic way, then we can allow that sex is not just flesh on flesh. Sex can be about arousal and soothing. I'm not going to pretend like it happens very often that I become aware of a patient having erotic feelings for me. But when I have grown aware of these feelings in the relationship, it almost always accompanies the fact that what is happening in regards to the attachment is something that has remained dormant for that patient for a long time. In this sense, I can engage in their desire with or without becoming aroused or stirred up myself because I understand that there is a deeper layer of meaning to their longing. I know there's a lot in the book about your own biography and around sexuality, but what are the factors in your own story that drove you in this direction? I don't know. It depends what day you're asking me, <laughs> because there are so <laughs> many narratives, right? And some of them mm -hmm. are really about where my parents are coming from, my Iranian grandmother and my Syrian grandmother and where they come from. When you sit with a patient, are you thinking about those early relationships, those early connections, and how the person was developing sexually at the time? Not necessarily. I'm mm -hmm. sitting with the patients and I'm with whatever they bring to the room, right? I, mm -hmm. I leave my theory at home sometimes. It's funny to think about it that way, right? Because you think like in the office, I have theory. At home, I have something else. It's kind of also the opposite, right? At home, you can think about theory. And in the office, you really meet people in the most intimate way, and I don't usually think consciously or introduce theory right into the therapeutic work. I feel like I meet a person, and I experience them, and I think about how I experience them, and how, right, and what's happening to me when I experience them. And I interact with them. The, the way I think about that is the way a concert pianist might sit down to play in front of people and they don't recall all the years and years of technique they've learned. They get into the music and they start playing. Exactly. I think it's a beautiful example, right? Even thinking about that, you know, you rehearse for things, you you have a technique, but when you're when you're playing, and especially on stage, right, in real time, mm -hmm. you feel something. And, and I think that's what we're teaching the next generation also, right, to, to, to feel something, to use their body even in order to feel, right? And it's not something we can teach, really, right? Ogden is the one who actually said that. Intuition is not something you can teach, and being with another person is not something you can teach. You can just help people get in touch with those parts of themselves. And, that, and I think in that sense, the relational approach is very helpful because it emphasizes the analyst's subjectivity, right? The way we experience ourselves in the room mm. with another person and what that indicates. A big theme that keeps popping up is affect regulation. Affect regulation is part of the way I think about psychoanalysis, right? And especially the dyadic co-construction, co-influence of, of the patterns of regulation and dysregulation that are part of the mother-infant dyad, but mm -hmm. also part of patient-analyst dyad. Right? And the way we mm -hmm. regulate each other and the way we dysregulate each other, right? So I think about it generally, it's part of my frame, part of my framework, but especially when it comes to sexuality. If we have a lot of listeners who aren't necessarily practitioners, and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what you mean by affect regulation and what, and, and particularly how it relates to sexuality in your mind. When I talk about affect regulation, I really talk about patterns of arousal and regulation, right? I mean, the easiest, I think, way for me to, to describe it is to think about infant research. And if you look at the videos of mothers and babies, and you see the ways the baby impacts the mother and the mother impacts the baby, right? And they co-create something, right? The idea of co-creation, but both... You know, in the more traditional way, we really thought the mother is the one that, that impacts the baby only. And now we, you know, our, our frame is a little different and we understand that the patients impact us as well and they can dysregulate and we dysregulate each other back and forth, right? In the videos of the mothers and babies, we often see, right, how 
when we look at eye contact, for example, eye contact as the most arousing thing, right? And the mm-hmm. ways babies, when they are dysregulated, try to regulate themselves by by tilting them, their heads away or right, not gazing at the mother is because eye contact is too arousing and heartbeats becomes right, fast. In that sense, right, when you see these videos and you see how a crying baby right, dysregulates the mother who becomes distressed sometimes because the baby cries and she cannot calm the baby down. That model, right, I find it very effective to the analytic work and thinking about the ways we in the room, right, help each other regulate or dysregulate each other. You know, and talking about sex can be really dysregulating. And and I want to add here the concept of enactment, right? And thinking about enactment that is inevitable, right? So in that sense, talking about sex is always to some degree enacting a sexual act. And we also, I think what I want to add to it, right, is that when we talk about sex, even in therapy, but not only, it's very similar to other ways when we talk about sex, right? In the classical model, we used to believe that there is a difference between talking and acting. And I think in the more contemporary way, when, you know, when using the word enactment, we understand that talking can also be acting, right? And of course, if you think about phone sex or, or anything that is sexual, right, sexuality is not only about touch, right? Sure. So in that sense, what I mean is that talking about sex is an acting having sex, right? It can be as arousing and and therefore when we talk about sex with our patients it's something to keep in the back of our mind the perception is that in order to be a good therapist you have to force yourself to talk with people about things that actually dysregulate you but you think that this is really important for the treatment so you have to ask details about their uh, sexual dream or not talk about it at all and i think that perspective of you know including affect regulation is a perspective that aims also to help us be able to include the body and include sexual material, right? And Mm -hmm. understand how we swim in it, right? How we regulate each other, how we arouse each other, how we, you know, how the diet can be more regulated, talking about that. It doesn't have to be talking about the details of something that dysregulates them. Sometimes I'll say as simple as that. I don't want to hear the details, right? Not necessarily to my patients, I'll say that. I'll say to myself or to my supervisee, right? That, yeah, but it's not always necessary. You know, the, uh, the analyst encouraging the details in the treatment might create an enactment of sexual activity, right? It might be as arousing as anything else, right? Is it important to uh, name it verbally with the patient? That's a good question. I think this question is relevant for every enactment, right? And I think, again, our perspective has shifted during the years where originally we thought about enactment as something that needs to be resolved. I think that the more contemporary view on enactment and the understanding that in everything there is an enactment, we think about the enactment itself as, right, as beneficial. Mm -hmm. When it comes to sexual material, I think that sometimes processing it is even more dysregulating, right? If if your analyst comes to you and say, hey, I think there is an enactment of having sex with each other, you know, that is very dysregulating. Sometimes we we should keep our interpretations to ourselves. In her book, The Enigma of Desire, Galit writes about the difficulty in writing on the topic of desire. She says... Words themselves are pragmatic. Therefore, while writing about the enigma, I always struggle with loyalty to that which is intangible. Giving the enigmatic a name, a shape, transforms enigmatic material into a more pragmatic form, and therefore, ultimately, we lose parts of its essence. This is the challenge I encounter throughout the writing, and this is also the challenge in our theoretical and clinical work. We have to recognize that some things can be heard only from the inside, not through the actual observed interaction between two people, but rather in the enigmatic, unseen zones of the internal mind. 
we learn to recognize that some things cannot transform into a pragmatic form without a level of distortion and even destruction. Some of our profound emotional experiences are isolated, unknown, and even lonely, as we can touch but never fully hold them. All I can say is same. With this show, we attempt to give you brushstrokes of the topics we discuss, but we can never really capture the full mystery of how these relationships work. We try, and the trying is helpful, but the enigma of how these relationships form and take place is never truly captured in a pragmatic form. One of the many layers of your writing is that sexuality and desire is not just about sexuality and desire. It's about multiple layers of relationship and personhood and mothering is a part of that. Right. That you can't talk about sexuality without talking about the process of how life is started. Listen, it's really true, but it's in some weird way. It sounds sometimes to people controversial. I, that I say exactly what you just said and, and add to it. And you cannot talk about desire without talking about your mother. And right. people look at me, yeah, but my mother, you know. And of course, what I add to it is the fact that mothers and babies have also kind of sexual attachment, right, relationship the body and the sensual and talking about the constitution of, of the unconscious and of sexuality, right, related to the mother's sexuality as well. So the mother's sexuality is also involved. One of the things that was surprising about this book is how much of it takes place in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Part of it is really pragmatic, as we say, because I was I, I have three children and I, I was writing the book uh, while I was cooking most of the time. So, mm -hmm. you know, some of the spices leaked in from my kitchen, leaked into my book. And I think I read something in the foreword that that wasn't intentional. It was not intentional originally, but then when I had a few people reading the book before I published it and before I wrote the introduction, and all of them came back to me and they said, what's this deal with the kitchen thing? And, you know, everything is about food and cooking and kitchen, and there are so many metaphors. And only then I, I was more aware that actually, oh, wow, I actually did that. And I started thinking about why I did that. And I think that's what's so beautiful about writing, right? I hope I'm correct. You grew up in an Iranian family in Israel. Yeah. There's a sense of otherness for you from a very early age of having that immigrant experience. Right. Listen, mm -hmm. there are many generations of immigrants, right? My parents and grandparents immigrated and then I immigrated, right? Uh, I'm also a mother that her children speak the language better than her. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious about your experience of immigration, especially around sexuality and desire. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I write a little bit about that in in the chapter on Sex in the Kitchen, the fact that desire and sexuality are very cultural and they're very different. I think there is something about Israeli culture, for example, that is much, much more direct and, and explicitly sexual, right? So there is something about how direct the culture is and how sexual the culture is. And and in the chapter, I'm, I'm talking more about the Iranian culture always being perceived as promiscuous, the, the tension between the, the ability to desire and prohibition, what the, the culture gives you permission for, right? For example, in the more conservative Iranian culture, you, you don't have sex before you get married, but desire is really part of the culture. And, and then when you move to the more, uh, to the east, to the West, including to Israel, actually, as part of the Western world, right? If you are expressing any any form of desire in the same way, you you are seen as primitive or or promiscuous, but you are allowed to have sex, right? So there is there is some confusion there. Desire and sexuality are not inclusive necessarily. Is that that seems like a pretty good basis for the pragmatic and the enigmatic? Mm -mm. Yeah, but you know, I think that it's true to, to our culture as well, right? The fact is that we, we, we have much more difficulty to desire than to act sexually, right? People have sex, and you can see that with younger people. They have, they have sexual activities, but they don't necessarily desire, if you know mm. what I mean. 
So there is a split there. It's not necessarily the same thing to desire and sexuality. Is desire too vulnerable for us? Is it too intense? Desire, maybe, maybe. Again, I'm, I'm thinking about it with you, you know, and I didn't think about it that way, but I'm thinking that it is maybe related to vulnerability in the sense that there is need in desire, right? At least potentially, you know, and there is something that you long for and there is something you want, you know, and here I think there is something more, and it's more enigmatic, right? Here there is more pro- pragmatic uh, aspect to it. When you want, you go and get and you do. You know, it's, it's pragmatism in, in some ways. I hear a lot uh, of resistance against being able to be needy, that it's very hard to admit neediness. This is part of the problem in our society, right? Independence and autonomy are prioritized. And, and think about Freud even in that sense, right? Autonomy, right, is, it means that you are separated. And it means that you're strong. And it means that in some ways, uh, with quotations marks, of course, that you are a man, right? And you're not dependent on your mother. You're not a needy baby, which creates a lot of problems, right? Because in some ways, we really underestimate dependency. We strive to, we're we're very lonely, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, We underestimate how much we need others, right? And and the need. And and I I think in New York City, definitely you see that people live by themselves and they raise families in very, very small families of a mother, you know, a mother, a father and a baby. And there is no community, Sometimes, and I think part of it is is related to the fact that we are in a culture that we really privilege uh, independence, and I don't know, you know, even in couples, I feel like, nah, you know, uh, <laughs> symbiosis is, is underestimated, <laughs> under undervalued in some ways, and I think sometimes it's it's not always something that is destructive. What brought you to the field of psychoanalysis. I, uh, I think I've heard that you also have a background in art. I was a musician in my youth, I would call it, and I was an, an art therapist. And it was my uh, my master degree originally was in art therapy, and then and then I did my PhD in psychology and, and my psychoanalytic training. It felt like uh, you know that one of those things that when you start doing, it seems like yeah, that's my home. And I think from the first psychoanalytic paper I read, uh, I felt like that was my home. And I maybe part of it was, of course, that I've been in psychoanalysis, right? But uh, I, I don't know because it doesn't mean everyone who goes to psychoanalysis be- feels like psychoanalysis is their home. But uh, but that's where it started. When I started, I started my own personal analysis when I was 20 years old, and I've been with a Kleinian analyst three times a week for 10 years. Many years ago, I saw a patient for about a year, who I'll call Gary. He was an elderly man who had seen over 10 therapists in the last 30 years, never sticking with any of them for that long. He had no friends and no family, and our weekly session was his only social interaction. As Gary and I worked together, we were able to accomplish some things that he wanted to accomplish, but perhaps more importantly, Gary became more attached to me than he had been to perhaps anyone in many decades. When I gave my notice at that clinic, we began to discuss what it would be like to end our work together after more than a year. Gary became more emotional as the date grew closer, and in the last 10 minutes of our last session, Gary told me that he had been attracted to me and that he would miss looking at me every week. It is still by far the most pragmatic declaration I have ever heard from a patient. And yet I knew, even in that moment, that when Gary talked about his sexual attraction, he was talking about something deeper than the pragmatic sexual desire. He was attached. In the chapter of her book, in which she discusses her patient named Leo, Galit writes, that for many people who have experienced failures in early affect regulations, becoming able to experience an adult erotic transference in the room is a therapeutic achievement, the result of working through many obstacles. For Galit's patient Leo, this was too frightening for him when they started working together. And there were times when Galit was frightened as well. 
She writes that Leo brought violent sexuality and part objects into the room. She would have difficulty with his aggressiveness and his invasiveness. Leo would talk about repulsive breasts and, quote, disgusting, stinking vaginas. He told Galit that he had difficulty with the way that she breathed, telling her that he thought it meant she was preoccupied with herself. He even fantasized about rape to her. She writes that things changed with Leo when she was able to bring to him the possibility that he too was frightened that she might hurt him. She writes, I hear him sigh in relief for the first time. We are both suddenly allowed to breathe. The thing that really stuck out with me is that con- that um, intersection between aggression with male patients. The sense of entitlement or the sense of aggression around relationship. Yeah. Listen, I don't think it's special to men, but, but it, sometimes it looks different because of the cultural roles, right, that men and women have in, in this culture, right? Mm-hmm. There is something really about the idea that women are more supposed to be more penetrable and men are not, and men are supposed to be so-called hard and independent. In your work, you talk about those that language pragmatically. I mean, you discuss the difference between the post-coital erection as being soft and the idea of ejaculation as crying. Yeah, but again, these are these are cultural ideas, right? That men are not supposed to be babies and are not supposed to be soft and they're not supposed to cry and right, this is how we all grew up. These are the roles that masculinity and femininity hold, right? The, the female is more gentle and the man is hard. And then if we think about being hard being uh, versus leaking or being uh, wet, you know, all of mm-hmm. those binaries between the two, right? We can feel that in our interaction with with people, right? What they're allowed to be and what they're not allowed to be. And a lot of the struggle that I was presenting is really with with being soft or with being having feelings or with being penetrable, right? There is this thought that if you're a man, you're supposed to penetrate, you're not supposed to be penetrated. And uh, of course, I challenge that. Right, and and talk about the, this if we refer to self states, right? My own self states or the, the patient self states. I can be a mother, I can be a father, I can be a man, I can be a woman, I can be a baby, I can be many things for my patients and experience myself in many ways with with another person. It seems like what you're doing, you're seeing the sex and everything, and also kind of separating that enigmatically sex is everywhere. It's all around us. Pragmatically, it's it's very much not. Listen, I also feel that it's problematic, like in any other thing, right, to talk about sex as separate, right? And it's like in institutes, in analytic institutes, when you have a course about sex, as if sex is se- as a separate thing. It's not related to your mind, it's not related to your body, it's not related to your unconscious, it's not related to anything, right? It's a, it's a separate thing. And in some ways, right, it's, it's, it becomes like a part object, Right. Mm-hmm. So when somebody talks to you about the breast, but they're not connected to a body, and so in a more integrated way, we have to connect everything with everything. Right. It seems like something that's even a part of our culture that synecdocal language, the idea of discussing the whole as by as defined by the part. Uh, I think of the language even of describing someone as a piece of ass. Yeah. That that's part of our culture, right? Right, I think that is true, and it's and 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 but it's also if you think about it analytically, it's part of pathology also, right? When somebody brings a part object to the something, somebody something is only partially right. When again, if we talk about sexuality, it's easier to describe it. Or in the Leo's case that I presented, right, he's talking it about a vagina, right? Mm. The vagina is not connected to anything; it exists by itself. Or, you know, when we talk about part objects and we talk about development, right, we're talking about the baby and the breast. The breast is not connected to the mother. It's the thing that feeds you. So, again, you develop, you know, traditionally, let's say, to be able 
to see something as part of a bigger thing. And, and of course, we're talking about thinking about nuances that ideally, right, we are able to do. And I think culturally, not always, right? More than anything else, right? Or if you think about borderline uh, personality, there is something that it's either or. It's, be, it's based on splitting sometimes. But, you know, I think traditionally it's mostly what we used to call primitive. I say used to call because I think we're not using, in contemporary psychoanalysis, we're not really looking at hierarchical, you know, structures of what's more primitive, what's less primitive. Again, traditionally, we, we think about the baby, right? And, and the, the baby and the breast, right? We always go back, at, especially if we're Kleinians, to the baby and the breast and thinking about how the baby, right, the, the function, the breast is a function. And so there is a use. We see the part of the other as something that we can use. If you think about theory, it's the same thing, right? Thinking about, about sexuality as part of everything we talk about. In regards to self-disclosure, what your clients know about you, uh, and what they know about your writing, it's, what is that like for you? Yeah, they have so much access to what you think about them. I, I have to tell you, first of all, I think patients in general these days have so much access to us, right? They can see even our family photos on, on Google. Somebody told me they can see the, the, how much their apartment costs when they Google them or, or an announcement about their marriage. Or It's very different from the forms of neutrality that we used to you know, talk about. There is so much information about us. And I don't make believe that that doesn't exist. On the other hand, in some ways, I'm very classical. I, I don't self-disclose so much. And I do believe that patients have the right not to know. They have the right to not know. I, I absolutely don't tell patients about myself, but I don't necessarily encourage, you know, this kind of, you know, I have a piece of me that that is, you know, I'm, I'm also an exhibitionist in some ways. <laughs> right? That's obvious, I guess. And it's interesting, you know, I have a few patients who came to me after they read the book because they read the book, right? And there's a lot of transference about who I am and what I am, and the gap is huge. Right between the way I think about myself and the transference after they read the book and on the surface had so much information about me and on the other hand, really they don't know anything about me and sure. there is a lot of room for, for transference and fantasy that we work with. You know, I think that is really what's so amazing about the mind, right, also, <laughs> that I, I had f five pieces in the New York Times so far and mm. some of my patients read them and some of them know about them and they don't read them and they don't n want to know and it's, it's the only way it comes up in the treatment is, you know, is understanding what is it that they don't want to know about about me or what is it that they don't want me to know about them and uh, you know and many and other things right that are related to internal reality but you see that people do very different things with the same information they they have and sometimes they just you know it's like when you don't want to see something you don't see it so sometimes you just don't see it it's not part of their frame is the need to not know our therapist in that kind of real world, every, you know, what they're what is going through their mind and what they're doing in everyday life, in our is our need to not know them in that way, possibly related to the same mechanism in us that is dysregulated when erotic transference enters into the relationship? Mm -mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know what? It's not only the need not to know, right? Uh, it's also the right not to know. I think patients have the right not to know. It is their treatment. And they have the right to really focus on themselves and us as their objects and the way they use us and who we are for them and what they fantasize about us. And I think in some ways uh, they, have, they really have the right not to know. And at the same time, what I want to say is that even when I... You know, uh, even when I have pieces in the New York Times uh, or when I'm, uh, I don't know, presenting and, and some of my patients are analysts, the people that don't want to know, they don't know, you know? Mm. Their, their mind is amazing that way. In a piece for the New York Times titled, Was My Patient Stalking Me? Galit discusses the case of Guy, a new patient who walked into her office 
with intimate details of her life, even down to where she went on summer vacation. She writes, Why would a patient want to make me so uncomfortable? My professional self should have been able to summon an answer, but I was paralyzed, unable to think clearly. It took me a few minutes to remind myself that Guy surely wanted and needed me to be scared. He needed to make me feel at least as intimidated as he felt when he walked into my office, perhaps as frightened as he was every day of his life. And so I'm curious about what the process, what your process is like when you find yourself being dysregulated by that dynamic. Mm-hmm. So that dynamic you're describing is the dynamic with that guy that, I'm, that I had in this article who walks in and basically tells me that he knows everything about me and it's the first session. Right, and he googled me, and he knows the name of my sister, and he knows where I live, and he knows where I went on vacation, and he knows my background, and he knows everything about me. And basically, you know, my way of regulating myself is to try to understand what is it about this guy? Why does he need that? Right, and for me, that's regulating. Right, to under not just to say, oh my god, I became paranoid, obviously, uh, but also to say, okay, there is one conscious intention here, and the intention here is to confuse me, to dysregulate me, to make me scared, and maybe I understand that that's the way he feels. Right, that he feels dysregulated and scared. It's the first time he's in therapy with somebody he doesn't know that wants to know everything about him, and he has many secrets. And he basically tells me, you know, I know all your secrets. You cannot, I know more about you than you know about me. So there is a power dynamic here already. And so you go back to curiosity when you get dysregulated. Yeah. To, to, you know, it, I go back to making sense, I guess, right? If something feels too chaotic and, and I don't understand it, I try to understand it. I try to make sense. And some of it is really only to regulate myself. Sometimes I make sense of things and, and I have to know that I, I won't always be right, right, about the way, the narrative I tell myself. And that sometimes the function of, of having a narrative is, to, is actually to regulate myself, to, to think that it's not chaotic, it's not scary, it's not out of control. There is a reason, right? It's happening because, there is because. It's because that's happening internally so it makes sense and then I'm and then I'm more regulated mm-hmm. thinking the, the ability to think about something is regulating and I think that's what we do something in order to 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 regulate ourselves even when if I go back to erotic uh, material right that something erotic is happening and the way to regulate the diet is to think about you know, about theory about the mother to go back to the, the the history, right? And it helps everybody calm down a little bit and make links, right? And and I think that in many many times I see that uh, theory in general regulates analysts. That's why we keep studying also. Right? You sit with a patient and you think to yourself, I have no idea what's going on here, and you become dysregulated, right? And mm-hmm. I, hear, I see especially young analysts, and they, immediately they go to theory and they say, oh, it's probably Winnicott and this and that, and then they calm down. That's such a gracious way of talking about what other times I think of the thing that I do, which is intellectualizing as a defense. But it's a more kind way of saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's less judgmental because, in some ways, when you say intellectualizing in a defense, you think to yourself, "Oh, I'm not supposed to be defensive." When you frame it as regulating, you think, "Yeah, I'm supposed to be regulated." <laughs> right? And so it helps sure. you think, like, "Yeah, sure, I'm going to say." And I think I actually think it's it's really true. It's okay to go to theory in order to regulate a diet, and then to go back to, right? The problem is that if you stay in one place, right? If you intellectualize all, all the time and the whole treatment is intellectual, then the intellectualization is not a way only to regulate, right? It becomes a way to defend against intimacy. Like everybody, like everything else, right, that you do mm. all the time. Gilly, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.
Our sincere thanks to our guest, Dr. Gali Atlas. Her book, The Enigma of Desire, is out now. We also want to thank our partners for season two, Medify, a free download on iOS and Android. Medify is an app for mind and body awareness. Go and get it today. This conversation has been brought to you by the Center for Object Relations, who are offering new classes this fall. If you're in Seattle, go and sign up at nwfdc.org. It's been our pleasure to bring you the second season of Between Us, a psychotherapy podcast. Our original soundtrack is slated to show up on iTunes on September 15th. Go and look for it in just a few weeks. Between Us is produced by myself, John Totten, and Mason Neely, who also composed our music. We had additional editing help from David Totten at Totten Audio in Seattle. We're going to take a few months off now, but we'd love to keep growing in that time. If you've liked the first two seasons of Between Us, which started about a year ago, please, 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 please tell a friend, or two, or three. We're proud of what we're doing, and we think it's beneficial to anyone interested in transformative relationships, not just practitioners of psychotherapy. You can keep in touch with us at betweenuspodcasts at gmail.com, or you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or even Instagram. And as always, we'd love you to subscribe to the show wherever you get podcasts. And we'd especially love your iTunes reviews. We're batting a thousand right now on iTunes reviews, and it really encourages us to keep going. We hope to send updates through our feed as the off-season progresses, but we hope you stay in touch and stay engaged. But in the meantime, take care.